time for us to begin, uh, I've been asked for us to go back over page 20, go back to page 25 and notice these questions uh, that we have listed here. So we'll do that and then we'll get into the idea of apostasy and that the New Testament did prophesy that there was going to be a, and we noticed that, beginning to notice that uh, last week. So we'll take up with these questions then uh, this evening. It says, answer these statements as a true and false without looking at the material given in part one. Okay? So uh, it is correct to refer to the church building as the church. All right. The, the word church may be used to designate any type of assembly according to the Greek language. That's true. Uh, the word church is used once in the New Testament refer to a mob. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at that one. I'm not sure about that. I think in Acts chapter 19 would be where it would be used as a mob if it is. But, uh, sir, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the only scriptural name for the church is the Church of Christ. That's right. There. Yes, there's other names too. Church of God would be... The church was established during the ministry of John the Baptist. Okay. The church and the kingdom are synonymous, used to describe the same entity. That is true. There could be other terms also. The last days refer to the period immediately before the second coming of Christ. Why is it false? So... So, we're in the last right. So, isn't this the period immediately before the second coming of Christ? chapter 2 uh, he talks about uh, Joel's prophecy I think that's verse 17 so this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and he says in the last days I understand what uh, the Bible says I understand what the premillennialists say so it all depends on how you look at it this is the last days as far as the Bible is concerned which would be right before the second coming so all depends on how you look at that. Uh, that. Uh, well, I, well, Daniel prophesied that the kingdom of the Messiah would be established during the Roman period of world rule. That is absolutely true. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. All right, the only function of a prophet was to predict future events. Thoughts. He is... That's right. Use, uh, he is to foretell and he is to foretell. A foretell, he is to preach God's word to those people. And if you go back to Isaiah and Jeremiah, he did preach to those people, but he also preached to, uh, and he also predicted the future too. Uh, Isaiah 53, well, you can start with Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, 6, and other passages. Uh, the only organization of the church, the elders, the deacons, and the Christians, is that of the local autonomous congregation. You tell me what. Oh, I would call that one true, though. Christ is not. In yeah. Yeah, I would say true. Uh, the plurality of pastors was chosen to rule over each church in the first century. That's 
that's right. Understand now, I am not a pastor. Yes. Her stepfather, yes. Yes. That, that's right. Trash man. Yes. Right. They canceled that. Uh, I told some of you, and I'll. There is a connection. You remember Rachel that did our ladies' day. That was her second cousin. Nick is her first cousin, her stepdaddy. Uh, that was, and so uh, there's, yeah. So anyway, uh, and I didn't talk about the plurality of overseers or elders. I just wanted to get the pastors in there. Pastors are only used at one time in your New Testament, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, by the way. The use of the religious titles such as Father, Reverend, Holiness is found in the New Testament. That is absolutely false. In uh, Psalms 111 verse 9, you find Reverend. In Matthew chapter 23, we find we're to call no man our Father, and that's a religious title. We have fathers, but we're not to... All right, verse number 13. The pastors, the overseers, and the elders are told to lord it over the flock of God. That's right. First Peter chapter 5 tells them that they are not to lord over God's heritage. The worship of the New Testament church was characterized by splendor and formality. No, that's right. Attitudes of worship are as important as forms of worship. That's right. John 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord's Supper is a memorial feast. That's right. All right, in the New Testament, there is no example of one joining the church. That's right, there is no. One may join himself to a local congregation. That is true. Baptism is a part of God's demand in order that one may be saved. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Their like figure were to even baptism, but also now save us. God's New Testament law is uniform and must be obeyed by all people. That is true. John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever. Now, who does the whosoever include? And that's the everybody. And then when you look at Matthew chapter 19, and verse 9, it talks about marriage in that, and it is the same whosoever. Uh, same in the original, and same there, too. Okay, any questions? About the questions or any things that we've talked about thus far. Okay. So now we have talked about, we have read Acts chapter 20, starting with about verse 29 and reading through verse 32 about the apostasy. Then we talked about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think it's 2, yes, 2 verses 1 through about verse 12 there and talks about the apostasy that would take place and the... Um, that would be happening then before Christ came back. We want to go to some other passages now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Uh, this is an interesting passage when we look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. We're at yeah, page 28 if you have your book with you. <coughs> In 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about something. 
here is the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit then, and the Holy Spirit then expresses an idea how? Only through words, you know. Uh, he does not use ESPN. Okay. Uh, only through words. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, what does it mean to have your conscience seared with a hot iron? Uh, that's right, hardened. That's right, and it would be carterized too. But it would be hardened then through... Uh, through these things, okay? Uh, there are some people who are so seared that it doesn't bother them to kill people. Uh, and that would be the kind of... Now, here are some of the things that they are teaching. There are they are teaching forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. I want to read on because it says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So, you know, when you eat chocolate-covered grasshoppers, there's nothing wrong with that, but you still need to give thanks to God for chocolate-covered Grasshoppers. You might want to thank God for boil, boiled okra. Okay? Uh-uh. Okay? That's different. I ain't going to boil some okra and just pick it up and lick that slimy stuff and just... No. Not... Not... Uh, okay. <clears throat> For it, that's talking about up here the the uh, food. Yeah. Yes. Because God's word says it is okay to eat it. Under the Old Testament, uh, when God uh, said to pray for your food. Jesus gave us that example. When he fed the 5,000, he fed the 4,000, and he prayed for it, and we need to be thankful for our food. All right, we set that food then apart to nourish our bodies. And then our bodies to thy service. Set apart, that's what it means. It doesn't mean, you know, so, uh, yes, I, I would never will forget that uh, I was with a bunch of preachers. Somebody had given us our food. We did not have to pay for it, and they were griping and complaining. And I stopped and said, you know, maybe we need to give thanks for this food again. You know, a bunch of ungrateful folk. One of my instructors says, you be glad for what's set before you, and you eat it. Let me tell you some things. N.B. Hardeman was at a place, and this is in one of the books that I read, and he was eating this pudding dessert, and he said, this is most excellent raisin pudding. And the lady says, those are not raisins. Those were flies. You know, and that's like when uh, we went to Panama and uh, the last night we were in, uh, what was the city? Santiago. And I always was, I was wanting to try their local food, okay? Just, and we went to a restaurant and, uh, you know, we got Chinese food. What I thought Chinese, I thought I can get this in America. Not this much, but I can get this in America. You know, we kept having pollo and, and rice. That's chicken and rice and chicken. Uh, yeah. 
And I said, well, I'm going to get me some shrimp. You know, I knew Judy couldn't eat it, so I wasn't all right there because she's allergic. So, I, man, I mean, they had some shrimp in their rice. Then we went to another rest, uh, to the restaurant there at the hotel, and I got some fungi. Mushrooms. Yeah, they, they all looked and said, I ate better than they did that night. Uh, but anyway, where we were, the church that we were working with was having a, had a fellowship that evening, and they served our plates. And you've got to understand how the, they didn't have room for you to walk through there and get what you want. And on this thing was this purple stuff. And it looked like it had been poured over a banana that had been set outside for about three weeks. Okay? Yeah, it, it was not very appetizing. The other stuff was tolerable looking. Okay? And, you, and I ate that, and, and I noticed some of our group was not eating that. And, I thought, and they were watching fairly close, and I thought, Okay, I may be up all night, but I'm going to eat this thing. So when I got through with it, I wanted more of that. It was good. I don't know what the, uh, the yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it was plum sauce, and that broke down with the enzymes and stuff like that. It was most excellent. The best thing, though, was they had homemade ice cream, and they did in a, served it in a styrofoam cup with no spoon. You have a wafer like the sugar wafers, and ate it with that. It was most excellent. Then we went to the Darien province, and uh, so on. I, was, uh, I was afraid to look at the food down there. They said, uh, with the water, you don't brush your teeth in the water, you don't ingest the water in any form or fashion. And when you saw the sanitary conditions, you said, I understand this quite well. And then the food, they were cooking it out over an open fire, which is not so bad, but you've got to understand, they were cooking this in this water that came from the stream that was muddy as all get out, and that they had already washed their clothes in, and the cattle had been in it, and bathed in it, and all this kind of stuff. But I didn't get sick, but it was okay. Uh, they also had McDonald's to save the... <laughs> save in, the in Santiago, they had a McDonald's. And Domino's Pizza was next door to the church building. So, you know, we did not starve by any... And the McDonald's did have fried chicken. I mean, on, on the bone. Yeah. Yes, it was chicken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I found in these third world countries that uh, you can survive, okay? Okay. Uh, it was very interesting. So uh, that passage always makes me think of those things. But notice they were speaking lies and hypocrisies. Now notice they were forbidding to marry. Do you know a group that forbids to marry? And they also command to abstain from meats. That's why in a lot of times when I grew up uh, and I was going to school, uh, they had fish on Friday. Okay. I don't know if they did that in the South so much, but I know when there that if so, we had fish on Friday. I never understood why. I just ate my fish, you know. I kind of liked it. And then I found out why. And then I had some Catholic friends, and they ate bologna on Friday, and I thought, what is this? Bunch of bologna. Uh, so I don't think they do that as much anymore now. Yeah. Yes. You know, they take a hot dog, what they do with bologna, they take a hot dog and get the roller right there. <laughs> do what? I was thinking. Uh, but this, now, uh, understand this is all good to be received with Thanksgiving, okay? So, uh, you know, it's like kind of like, my mother fixed an opossum one time for my brother. It, yes, a possum. And I'm not quite that hungry. I'm not saying I wouldn't eat it, but I'm just not quite that hungry yet. Okay? Uh, squirrel dumplings are very excellent. Especially if you get a... 
especially if you get a fox squirrel and a gray squirrel together. It's really good eating. All right, now let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. He says, I charge thee. Now there in Timothy, there are several charges. Paul gave Timothy several charges. I charge thee to teach no other doctrine. But here's another charge. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead, as he is appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. I think we as preachers need to learn that longsuffering. Okay? And the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and be turned unto fable. I had a preacher friend of mine. I could call his name, and some of you may recognize his name, but he was preaching at one place, and he was preaching on the cross, on the crucifixion of Christ, and he noticed people were falling asleep. So he said he stopped. In the middle of this, and he said, once upon a time, there were three bears. There was a mama bear, papa bear, and a baby bear. And he says, when he got further into this, he noticed these people were no longer falling asleep. And then he stopped and said, you people will listen to fairy tales and pay attention to fairy tales more than the cross of Christ. And we do that sometimes. Okay. Uh, so we need to pay attention I know it's hard and difficult at times uh, I was at Memphis School of Preaching and I was having difficulty staying awake in class Okay, and I was taking some medicine finally it dawned on me to read the back of the medicine it says may cause drowsiness I was taking contact. I had an upper respiratory infection. And uh, so I found out why I was, you know, wasn't all my fault, but anyway. But they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fable. There are some people that don't want the truth. They don't want you to preach the truth. They want you to preach what uh, soft soap. You know, they don't want this hard stuff. They don't want the lava. They want y'all remember what lava is, okay? Uh, they want the soft soap, and so uh, they shall be turned their way, their ears from the truth, and be turned unto fables. So here's prophecy of these things: what's going to take place. Now let's go to Matthew chapter twenty-four. starting then if any man shall say unto you lo here is Christ or there believe it not for there shall arise false Christ false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they should deceive the very elect behold I have told you before so here's Christ telling him that there's going to be false prophets now, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are God, because there are many false prophets gone out into the world. We try these teachers then by according to God's word. Also, we find that the Bible says, By their fruits ye shall know them. Uh, we have a tree in the back of our house, and uh, the first year we were there, the first spring we were there, it started putting on some fruit. I thought it was going to be pomegranates. Okay? Wound up being a pear tree when it all got said and done, but we couldn't tell what it was until it produced the fruit. So, if you want to know what a man's teaching, notice his students. And that will tell you what he's doing, and that's basically what he's saying here. All right, now let's go to another passage. Let's go to 2 Peter. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you. 
So here's Peter telling them there's going to be false teachers there who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destructions. We find that uh, there were some even in Paul's day who were saying that the resurrection has passed already. And we have people who are members of the church who are saying that the, that the resurrection, the second coming of Christ has already taken place. And uh, my question to them and, uh, uh, would be, why are you partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Now, I know that they are doing that, and the reason I know that they're doing that is because a friend of mine went to that congregation not knowing where he went, and uh, they partook of the Lord's Supper. Well, why? Because the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, says you're gonna, you do this uh, until he comes. And if he's already come, then why are they doing it? And by the way, let me hit your big toe with a sledgehammer and see if it hurts. Because the Bible says that there's going to be no pain. Okay? If there's going to be no pain, then if I hit your big toe with a sledgehammer, you're all right. Uh, we know better than that, don't we? So there's just some things that are going on that we know. There's people that are teaching false doctrine then. Damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That's like when, who was it, Jim Jones in Africa? How did he get people to follow him? How did he get people to drink poison? And we're talking about educated people. We're not talking about people who were uneducated. How did he do that? Now, here's a man who had to have a charismatic personality, and people would just follow him everywhere. Uh, I'm thinking, I, you know, I can't even get people to hear me preach the truth sometimes. And he's got people following him just to death. Okay, South America. Okay. Uh, anywhere, somewhere south of us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. There are, well, Joel Osteen wouldn't preach on those things. Places to be avoided and it's things to avoid uh, and that's what the preacher needs to be telling you here's some things to be avoiding if you're participating in these things you need to come out from among them some people call that negative preaching but all that is is telling you what where you know here's what God expects of us yes well, I don't want to hear that either yeah yeah don't, don't drink my Coca-Colas, my, you know, anything brown, don't drink. But you just wiped out half of the, yeah. So here he is then the prophecy that would take place, and we find that some of this was taking place during the very first century. Okay, so we're talking about within, and uh, even in Acts chapter 15, we have some who were saying that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And there's nowhere in the Bible that says, well, under the Old Testament they did, but I'm talking about the New Testament. And nowhere in the New Testament says you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Uh, that's, you know, that showed a covenant relationship under the Old Testament. Uh, interesting, some things that we could go on with that. But... Uh, that's not our subject tonight. So over on page 29, we're going to see the beginning then. Uh, and he talks about, uh, here is the changes. Of course, this is Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 29, continue through verse 32, that there's going to be a change in the church organization or church government. Okay, that's Acts chapter 20, verse 30 then. And so this is what we had, and it was a, 
you know, this doesn't happen just wholesale, just boom, and it's this way. The Pope just, it took 600 years for, the, for us to have a Pope man to describe himself as a pope and so what happened was here was then a man then it started out just uh, every congregation had their uh, own elders and then from the elders this man then would be influential and they would say well you need to come over here and you need to be over us and he said well i can't do that but then they kept persuading and why don't you just come over here and sit in on our elders meeting and then you know give us some advice and he said okay and and then it just, it just grew. And then they said, well, why don't you just be over us too? And they said, okay, we'll do that. It'd be a lot easier for us then. And so that's the way this thing started. And then you had provinces. And then, you, you know, in uh, Louisiana, they had parishes. And that's from the Roman Catholicism. Um, and there would be a group of men, maybe not another group, but there would be certain individuals would be over each parish. Uh, and then you have... And see, the Bible does not speak of bishops and cardinals and, yeah, uh, well, yeah, cardinals and archbishops and that type of thing. Okay, uh, that's right. In uh, Titus chapter 1, we find that the elders are to convince and convict the gainsayers. And I think in a congregation, uh, most of the time we have a preacher. Uh, and that preacher can lead that congregation in some ways, but they need to be the first line of defense. And if a preacher stands up and preaches something false, knowing that it's false, sometimes, you know, you have... Uh, Moses building the ark and that's just a mistake of slip of the tongue I almost had that yesterday and I caught myself before I said that but you, you know there is the first line of defense and if and they need to stand up and say well this is wrong you know and this is why this is wrong and so they need to be able to do that uh, and then I think the preacher also if the elders bring in something needs to be able to stand up and say really needs to meet with them and do this in a cordial way. Uh, I think all of this needs to be done in a cordial way. You know, uh, let's, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, the golden rule, verse 12. We need to follow that. We need to treat others like we would want to be treated. And then that needs to be handled. And if it's not handled, then there needs to be something done. And so, uh, but every member every member should be uh, knowledgeable enough. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you with the reason of the hope that lieth within you with meekness and, fear, and uh, meekness and fear. Every member needs to be studying their Bible and knowing what God would have us to do. That is the best defense against the devil and him raising his ugly head in a congregation and wreaking havoc over a congregation. And so we all need to be studying God's Word. And if we'll study 15 minutes every day, you'd be surprised at the knowledge that we will have attained. Now, you may not memorize things. I've had to memorize some things because of my schooling. And that's okay, but you need to know where a passage is. I had a teacher one time in biology, he says, if you'll know where to find stuff, you'll be better off. And so, you know, um, Larry and I were talking about um, some things this morning, and, uh, you know, with the, 
the advent of uh, our telephones and having Bible programs on there, and they're so cheap, you know, there's no excuse for us not knowing. You know, if we'll know how to use our Bible helps, we'll know how to use our Bibles, then there's no need for us not to study. Uh, we spend time in front of the TV or reading novels or something like that, and we can just turn that off for a little bit, do a little bit of studying in God's Word, and we'd be better off. You'd be surprised how interesting the Bible is. Uh, we're going to, we're on Exodus chapter 37, I believe it is, or 38? 38. 38, okay. And then we're going to go into the book of Leviticus, and some people will say, that's the most boring book. It is a boring book, but it's also very minute detail of how to approach God. Uh, and so uh, it's very interesting to me when you look at it because you need to study this book in order to understand the book of Hebrews. And so when you understand their sacrificial system and then when he comes up to Hebrews, you'll say, now I understand. Okay. The blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin, but they had to offer those things. That rolled their sins uh, forward, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. All right, so here was then, and he talks about that, the presiding bishop and all those kind of things and how it goes. And so you can read some of this. I'm not going to read all through all of this because you can read this at home. Uh, and then uh, look on page 31. So we had the development and the change of the organization of the church. But also, and almost simultaneously, we have the concept then of the changing of Christian ministry. And what's going to develop is laity and clergy. I despise those names. Um, it's kind of like calling the preacher pastor. I love it when they call up and say, is the pastor in? And I said, nope. Well, when will he be in? I know what they're asking. When will he be in? I said, well, you can call on Wednesday night or you can call Sunday morning. And I know that they're not going to do that. Uh, and then sometimes some of them are bright enough to say, well, is the preacher in? I said, bingo, you got him. And so that's what they're asking for. But I'm not the pastor. And I just, you know, sometimes those people then in the... Um, Media uh, have got the wrong influence and they call everybody the preacher, they call them pastors and that type of thing. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, you can even... Do what? Elder? Yes, I would, because that would then um, put me in that position. Uh, My son was on the radio and was uh, working in a radio station in Lineville, Alabama, which is in Clay County, Alabama, and uh, he had to read the obituaries. They read uh, every morning, and I think on the weekend, especially on Sunday, they read the obituaries over the, and uh, he didn't call them reverend or pastor or father so-and-so, and they called him in and said, you'll do this, and he says, no, I won't do this and, and I think they had a parting of the ways uh, of that uh, because of that so uh, I appreciated the stand that he took so here is then this idea on page 31 coming back to the idea of clergy and what that did then that allowed and only the clergy could do certain things see only the clergy and it has its background in the priest under the priesthood under the Old Testament. Uh, they were the only ones who could worship or offer the sacrifices. But now you're going to find only the preacher could marry, bury, and do certain things then in the worship. And we aren't going to love, we, we're not going to let the laity do that. They're just not good enough to do that. And we're going to do that. And we got this idea that uh, he's the clergy and he needs to do that. Uh, and so that's not what needs to be done. We all need to be doing our work then in the church. Uh, look on page 32. You can read more about that laity and the clergy thing and all of those. On page 32, after you see that little indention there, it says another apostasy initiated during the first four centuries is that which displaced the New Testament. 
And I want to spend a little time here so we may not get through with this. But now, as the New Testament then is no longer our source of authority in matters of religion, we're going to have other things that are the source of religion, a uh, source of authority in matters of religion. If you talk to uh, someone who is a Catholic, they, the Bible is not their only source of authority. They have their priest who is a source of authority. They have their, the church who is a source of authority. And they have, uh, uh, yeah, they have the, some man-made doctrines, let's just call it that, that are their source of authority, and they do use the Bible. But all of those uh, is their source of authority. And it's not just one thing, but the Bible then is our only source of authority in matters of religion. If you wanted to find about baseball and find out the rules about baseball, where would you go? Would you? All right. And if you're going to play baseball according to the American League, you have one set. If you're going to play it, a set of rules. If you're going to play by the National League, you have one set of rules. But by the way, when you go into certain ballparks, you have certain rules. Also, so when, go ahead. Yes. 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 Uh, when he offers a bull, B-U-L-L, -L. and then he gets into it, but there's other, uh, another word for that, and I can't think of it right now, but when he's sitting then on his throne and he issues an edict, then that's what that church believes, and you're going to find then over the years, and we're going to talk about some of this, how late it was. Uh, as late as 1950, uh, they venerated uh, Mary and did some things with Mary. They realized some things that they needed to do. The Immaculate Conception is not talking about Jesus' birth, by the way. It's talking about Mary and her birth. Yes. Earth. Yes. We'll talk about that. Yes, sir. And see, that's, that's like uh, some of these are having their conventions and they're deciding whether to take homosexuals. Uh, but let's go back before them because that is, and they're talking about having women then in the clergy. Uh, that's another time I think. And, uh, you're letting women then be preachers. And the Bible does not allow for that. She's not to teach nor to usurp authority over a man. And they say, well, Paul was just a, a male chauvinist pig. And I'm thinking, when did we have male chauvinist pig all come up as a, a phrase? 60, 70, sometimes whenever it was. But uh, so how can... Yes. That's right. If you'll notice, this was not cultural. Paul goes all the way back to the beginning of time. And it has to do with who was created first. That does not mean that the women don't have, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle. What's the rest of it? All right. There's, there's an extreme, extremely lot of truth in that. Um, and that behind every successful man. Yeah. So, there's, there's truth to that. <laughs> That's probably true, too. So, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, when we look then at Acts chapter 9, there is a time when, uh, you know, 
somebody might say, well, we women can't do anything. You read Acts chapter 9. When Dorcas passed away and how many people grieved. Uh, when we look at First, Peter, First Timothy chapter 5 and what the women were to do that were caught in that, uh, in the, uh, taken up in the number, uh, there was a lot that she was to do to be qualified even to do that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, when uh, that is right, and Judy, let me tell you what Judy is talking about because I forgot about that. But when uh, who told the disciples that Jesus was resurrected from the dead? And it was a woman. So there's some way that she can convey some truth uh, to other people. So we'll take up some of these things then and uh, let's take up with number three because we want to talk about some of these councils and some of these things that we're talking about and how they develop then into finding out. But we cannot change God's word. Understand something. We cannot change God's word. All right, we'll take up 32 next week. Page 32.